So, welcome everyone. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about software architecture. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like this talk to be a little bit interactive, so I'm going to ask a bunch of questions during the talk. Hopefully you can all participate and uh, you know, make this a fun, enjoyable experience for everyone. So if you think you know the answer, just shout it at me. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand, et cetera, et cetera. So to talk about software architecture, I'd like to begin uh, with a few of the greats from the early days. So first question, who knows who this is? You can just shout. Uh, no. It's not Paris Hilton. <laughs> yes, Hopper, very good. So this is Grace Hopper. Um, she's famous for, anyone knows? Cobol, yes, but uh, more specifically? She's one of the first programmers, yes, but she's most famous for inventing the compiler. So something that translates English into actual you know, computer machine code. In her days, they had uh, punch cards and these kind of magnetic um, tapes. So they actually had to you know, do actual bits and bytes to make the computer do stuff. And there's a fun story about her where she dreamt up of a way in which you can write English and the computer would understand it. So she went to, the, to her boss and said, hey, I have this idea. How about we make some thing where we can type English and then the computer will execute it? And the boss said, well, that's, that's just silly. Computers don't understand English. So that's why she invented a compiler 10 years later and not 10 years earlier. It's kind of sad. So next one, who's this? Anyone? Dennis Ritchie, very good. So where, what is he famous for? C, very good. Uh, one of the original writers and inventors of the C uh, language, also large contributor to the Unix system, of which you know, Linux and Mac and everyone else originates. So another one, who's this? Not Donald Trump. <laughs> not sure. Not my grandfather either. So this is Alan Kay. Um, he's most famous for being the father or grandfather of object-oriented programming. Kind of important. Um, and then who's this? Anyone? Again, not my grandfather. So. Um, this is Edgar Dijkstra, uh, very famous, why? Because he's Dutch, very good. So, <laughs> next one, another big one from the software industry. Who's this? So, Bruce Lee, right? So, in this talk, I'm going to try and prove to you that, so, uh, that Bruce Lee was actual software architect, um, way ahead of his time, and we can use much of his principle in software today. So in order to do that, we have to go back in time. Back in time to his uh, era where I was still in university and I wanted to be the best programmer that ever lived. I wanted to be you know, the greatest. So I read all the books, every piece of book, whatever you know, I read them all from uh, pra uh, Practical Programmer, Mythical Mammoth, all of them. Colloquially, if you want to know which books are worth reading, there's a very interesting site called Dev Books, and it lists all the most recommended books um, on uh, Stack Overflow. And interestingly enough, Working with Legacy Code is the most mentioned book on Stack Overflow by like a large margin. So I would say that says something about our industry, right? So, I also, during that time, was a big fan of these diagrams. Who knows what this is? UML. Very good, so UML, so like these big, you know, uh, designs of software, very big, very large. Um, and I thought then that if I write my UML diagrams, my software in UML diagrams, just, you know, perfect, I would build the perfect software, right? It would, should, would all be captured in this big software design, and it would be the best software design ever, all right? So it would be just perfect. I also was a big proponent of Solid. We all hopefully learned Solid. Um, so Solid principles, my code was very solid. Solid like the Chinese wall, you could see it from outer space. That's how rigid my code was. Very cool. 
But then I watched a bunch of old movies, mostly Kung Fu, and this stuck by me. Notice that the stiffest tree is most easily cracked, while the bamboo survives by bending with the wind. So this always kind of stuck with me as a sort of you know, interesting notion. And the reason was is that while I built all this software with all these UML diagrams and all these you know, grand design things, I always came up with this guy. So for those of you who are not as old as me, this is uh, Inspector Clouseau. Yeah, he solved a bunch of murders and you know, riddles. And the one thing he always did was just when he was about to walk away, he turned around and said, there's one more thing, and then he asked a question that usually exposed you know, the, the, the perpetrator or the murderer, et cetera, et cetera. And he reminds me a lot of my clients. So whenever I talk to my clients, <laughs> I'm, apparently I'm not the only one. <laughs> whenever I talk to my clients, I was like, is this going to change? No, it's not going to change. Are you sure? Yes. Is this going to be you know, always true? Yes. And then just before we launch, it's like, you know, remember that thing I told you that's not going to change? Yeah, we need you to change that because that's not true anymore. And then I felt like this, right? My entire UML diagram was, you know, fell apart, fell into pieces. It was not a pretty sight, to be quite honest. So this reminded me of a game I played. Um, I'm an avid Diablo player. For those of you know, who don't know the game, it's an uh, RPG where you just run around dungeons, kill stuff and then you get better gear and better loot and more XP and you get better and better. But I'm, you know, I'm a little bit twisted, so I play the hardcore ver version, which means that you can play the game uh, for weeks, months, years to get better and better, but if you die in hardcore, you have to start all over again, right? And the first time I died in Diablo, I felt horrible. I mean, I spent weeks and months sinking into, into this character just like a project, doing my other best to be the best of the best. And then it was suddenly, you know, it, was all hor it went all horribly wrong. And I, it, it, I felt so bad about it that I stopped playing for a little while. And then I started again, uh, simply. But, you know, the feeling of me of, you know, uh, playing hardcore still went, uh, went with me while I played, so I played way more careful. And the reason was is that I was very attached, very you know, deeply ingrained with my character. I, I really felt for him, basically. So the same goes for our code and our projects. We feel very attached to our code, right? Which means we don't like to change it much. I mean, if it's there, I mean, and someone says it's wrong, we say, no, -uh, it's perfect, right? <laughs> so the reason why that happens a lot, to me anyway, is this is my plan, this is my beautiful URL diagram, or UML diagram, and then this is how the project actually goes. <laughs> but this is a fact of life, right? I mean, the fact that you're all laughing means you've come across this quite often, probably. So, Bruce Lee says, life is never stagnation, it is constant movement, constant change. Right? And this is true. I mean, this is life. Projects aren't stale. They change over time. This is kind of like this. So you start out with a lion. For those of you who don't know, this is called a chimera. So you start out with a lion, and then your client says, well, it also needs to fly. And you're like, okay, lions don't fly. Okay, well, well, we'll just add wings. This is just an edge case, whatever. And then he says, well, it also has to breathe fire, because every project needs you know, breathing fire. And it also needs a tail and a goat's head for whatever reason. So your project usually you know, ends up like this. And you're like, that's not a lion. But that's because a, a project evolves, right? It, it changes over time, requirements change. Not because our clients uh, don't like us, it's just the fact of life. So the reason is nobody writes perfect code the first time, so we have to change this, except for this guy. But yeah, there's only one of him. So, as I said, we started talking, um, let's talk about software architecture, right? So what is software architecture? So this is the big architect. Um, let's see. Who can tell me what this is? A church, very good. What's its function? <laughs> Apparently we're, Mostly atheists here. <laughs> so its function is churching, right? So <laughs> what is this? Stadium. Stadium, very good, very good. 
Um, what's its goal? Well, actually, there are two goals, but what is its main goal? <laughs> Football, very good. What else? It's, you know, it's sports ball-ish, something to do with balls and sports and running. Um, but yeah, pretty clear what this is, right? So this one is harder. What is this? So what if I tell you that uh, gray long things are shelves and the uh, black dots are columns? Library. library, very good. So what's the goal of the library, or what's, what is the purpose of the library? Store books, rent books. It's pretty obvious what a library does, right? So now you're all thinking, well, what the hell does this have to do with software, right? So those who are unaware they are walking in the darkness will never seek the light. I know what you're thinking. We're not architects, we're software architects. I don't know anything about churches and uh, you know, libraries and stuff. I know about software. So let's talk about software. So this is a typical project. Who can tell me what the stack is for that project? Rails, very good, and Ruby. So tell me, what does this do? Anyone? Applications. Applications. No, that's true. What else? Tem Maybe. So we don't really know what the function is, but that's you know kind of mean question because obviously it's an MVC framework and we store all the businessy stuff in the M. So let's see, look at that. So let's look at app. So we have controllers, helpers, models, views, right? So let's look at models. Okay. So we have issue. We have journal, mailer, role. Token, user. That's pretty sure, you know, pretty easy what is that, right? Let's say it all together. <laughs> no? It's not GitHub. Well, obviously say, well, that's not fair. I mean, we need to look at the controllers to see what it actually does. That's normal in MVC. Okay, so let's look at controllers. So we have account controller, we have boards controller, Journals controller, my controller, best controller, uh, roles controller. Anyone? What does this do? Magazine. Sorry? Magazine. Magazine. No. Jira. Jira. No. It's not Ruby, by the way. It does Java. Some kind of Basecamp. Basecamp. Also no. Some kind of CMS. Some kind of CMS. Eh, ish. Bug tracker. Ish. So this is the source code of Redmine project management tool, which was obvious uh, from uh, look, just looking at the code. Now, I know what you're all thinking. I mean, we're all Laravel developers here, or PHP developers, and this is Ruby, so it's unfair, right? Let's try something, you know? So, <laughs> okay. So, this is more, you know, comfort zone. What's this? One, two, three. Very good. So what does this app do? <laughs> it Laravels. OK. <laughs> so let's look at app, obviously. So we have app, which has commands, console, events, exception, models. Ninja? Ninja? Holy moly. <laughs> we have Ninja in here. OK. Best you know, project ever. So let's look in Ninja, because ninjas. So data tables, imports, intent, mailers, notification, payment drivers, presenters, repositories, serializer, transformers. Pretty clear what this app does, right? I know what you're thinking. This is Ninja, so they're trying to hide their intent. So let's look at the models. So we have account, we have bank, we have client, we have font, document, size, task, Anyone? OK, that's too much at once. <laughs> One at a time, please. Webshop, Web no. CRM? CRM? No. Laracon? Laracon, also no. Payrolling. Payrolling. Yeah, close. Sorry? Uh, Stripe, yeah, also close. Invoicing, very, very close. So let's look in the controllers just to make it clear. So we have invoice controller, so invoice is close. We have ninja controller. We have quote controller, bank controller, bank accounts, 
API base controller. So we were very close. This is a personal finance management tool, which was obvious from the controllers, right? So this is kind of weird to me. Whenever I go into a project, and a legacy project, or takeover project, I look at the code base, and it's like, I have no idea what this does. This kind of sucks for me, because I usually you know, have to fix it. And if I don't know what it does, I usually can't fix it. So it's very hard for me to understand what certain apps do. So to illustrate why this is difficult for me, let's just say we build a house. But we do it the software architect way, instead of the constructor way, right? So we already had Laravel, so let's try Symfony now, just for comparison. So instead of models, we now have entities, because reasons. So we have a house bundle, so we model a house. We have uh, controllers, bed controller, clothes controller. We have some entities, bed, very important when you build a house. Floor, wall, we have some repositories, and we have some services. Change room surface. <laughs> okay. Um, so, who can tell me, just looking at this picture, how many floors does this house have? Yes. yes. <laughs> Very good answer. Okay. So, we have stairs controller. So, we could argue that there are at least two, maybe. But maybe it's just the stairs coming up to the door, right? We don't know. So the only answer is, we don't know. So how many windows does this house have? Yes. <laughs> Again, it's kind of hard, right? So we have this weird notion or tension when we build our software, and we do it the software way, and I was a contractor to do it like this. Well, let's put all the walls here. So there's our walls. Let's put all the windows there. That puts all the cement over here and all the windows over here. So this is your house, pay me. This is how we build software. And I mean, we're not unique, everyone does that this way. So is this a good way? Well, I think we can do better. I'm not saying this is the way, but what if we build an actual house? So an actual house with two floors, the first floor, second floor, we have some rooms in there, and we have in the rooms, we have some actions we can do, and we have some stuff that's inside the room. And obviously, we have a shared stairs because it doesn't belong to one floor, right? Isn't this a little easier to understand what we're actually trying to do? So this is kind of a thing that you know, stuck with me, is that it's kind of weird how we build our software in general, right? It's kind of like we forgot one of the basic rules of software, basically. Keep it simple. Can't we do better? Isn't there other options, right? So this one basically kind of feels like this. So the junior hard codes it, the media creates an abstract factory for it, and the senior hard codes it, right? And it's kind of to do, uh, it has to do with where in our timeline or our career we are, the way we set it up. So what does this have to do with Bruce Lee? Well, when Bruce Lee was very young, 12 to 16-ish, he went to school in Bangkok. And at that time, in Bangkok, there were a lot of uh, gangs out there, like youth gangs. And basically what they did is they just robbed people, stabbed them, you know, kicked them, all that kind of fun stuff you do when you're in a gang. And Bruce Lee, being uh, a little bit tiny, was the butt of most of those things. So he, he uh, saw a lot of harassment, and uh, he was you know, beaten up quite a few times. So he learned to fight on the streets, just as self-defense, right? So when he was on the streets, he learned to fight with everything he could find. If he could find you know, a garbage uh, bin, he would, use, he would throw that. If he would find a rock, he would throw that. If he would find a piece of wood, he would use that. But obviously, gangs were, you know, very, you know, very big, and he was just him, and he was 12 to 16, so he got beaten up even though he used everything he knew, uh, knew in his arsenal. So at some point, he was like, okay, I'm getting pretty tired of this getting beat up thing, right? And 
This is kind of how juniors start programming. When you don't know anything, you just go on Stack Overflow, you type in a question, you see somebody copy-pasted some code, you're like, ha, huh, that works. You copy-paste it, put it in your program, run it. Yes, it works. You don't know about security holes, and you don't know, you know, a proper separation, all that stuff, but you don't care. You just want to, you know, program something. And the same was true for Bruce Lee. He didn't care about all the fighting styles. He would just didn't want to get beat up. So at some point, he was um, beat up so many times that he was like, hey, there's probably people out there who actually know how to fight properly. Maybe I should try and learn that. So he went to this guy, Ip Man, and trained uh, Wung Shun from him from 16 to basically the, the end of his lifetime. <coughs> and he learned Kung Fu. And not just any form of Kung Fu, he learned all the Kung Fu. He learned Snake. He learned uh, crane, or as we call it in the West, crane. Um, he learned tiger style, any form of kung fu you can think of, he mastered it. And he traveled the entire country of China, studied with all the big, you know, big names in kung fu at that time. Oddly enough, every kung fu master he came across told him the same thing. If you study my kung fu version, it's the best there is. You'll be perfect, you'll be unbeatable. I mean, you would be the best fighter ever. Which is kind of weird, because there are 1,500-ish types of Kung Fu. It's kind of weird to think about they're all the best, right? So he went to all these dojos, learned, learned, but he was always a kind of skeptic about, hey, if you learn this one, it's going to be the best. Because he grew up on the streets where most Kung Fu's assume that a, you know, an enemy comes straight at you, that you do some complicated moves with your hands or with your feet, and then you win. But in the streets, it didn't really work that way. It just meant that you would, you know, you get attacked from the side, mostly from the back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most of these Kung Fu, they didn't really, you know, accommodate for that. They assumed that you were in a fair fight. And Bruce Lee thought, well, this doesn't work in real life. But the fact that every Kung Fu master says mine is the same. It's very interesting to notice because we do the same in, uh, in software. So it's object-oriented versus functional versus imperative, right? It's uh, PSP versus Ruby versus Python. Learn my language is going to be the best. It's this framework versus that framework. It is stats versus spaces, Emacs versus Vim. Everyone says, hey, if you learn my tech stack, you're going to be the best ever, which is kind of odd, right? And then there was this little other thing, is that Bruce Lee's parents weren't, well, his mother anyway, wasn't full-blood Chinese. And in that time and era, it was forbidden to teach Kung Fu to outsiders. So he, him learning Kung Fu was actually, quote unquote, illegal. And a lot of people didn't want to train with him. That also had to do that he was very good at what he learned and usually beat them, but also they, did, you know, they didn't want to train with him. So he had to kind of figure it all out on himself. So they would t tell him the basics, but not like the ultimate move, basically. So he learned them all, and I mean literally all, including drunken kung fu style. Uh, I won't get into you know which programming language this is. Anyway. Because nobody wanted to train with him, he kind of sort of had to wing most of it, like, you know, wing it. So, um, after he studied all these different kinds, he came up with a revelation, or enlightenment, as you say. He thought, well, all these different forms of style have something useful for me. They ha there's something in there that I can use. It's just not all of it. So he said, use only that which works and take it from any place you can find it. Right? So he took all these different styles in, picked and chose what he thought it was interesting, and then created Jeet Kune Do, which roughly translates to Bruce Lee's Kung Fu, very roughly. And Jeet Kune Do's style is actually very simple. It has three methods or three rules, efficiency, directness, simplicity. So efficiently, don't waste energy when you're fighting. Directness, you know, if you can hit someone, hit someone. Simplicity, you know, don't get hit. Now you're all thinking, well, that sounds pretty simplistic, but you know, that's how it goes. So, the less effort, the faster and more powerful you will be. So not only was Bruce Lee a software architect, he also was an agile coach, way before his time. 
So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Bruce Lee Driven Development, also known as Jude Kindo, also known as BLDD, because we already have TDD, BDD, and DDD, and this one has four, so this is better. That's, how, that's the rule. So, BLDD, being it at the core, that's the first rule. What is the core? That sounded weird. So, of course, the planet. How do we find the core? How do you understand what the core is of our problem we try to solve, right? Luckily, there's a very good book about this. If you're ever in a position to read this, I strongly suggest you do it. It's called uh, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software, written by Eric Evans in 2004. Um, and it basically only talks about how do I get to the core of a problem. So, raise of hands, who sees a white shirt, or a white dress, sorry, or a go white gold dress? So about 20% of you. Who sees a blue-black dress? The other 80%. So this is the problem we face in software every day. We can both look at a problem and both come up with completely different vision of that problem. And to underline this, communication is one of the hardest problems to solve, especially effective communication. So, in order for us to actually try and get a vision of what a problem is, we first have to get away with all our preconceptions, pre-notions about what we think the problem is. So instead of going in a meeting saying, hey, the, the dress is blue or and black, don't assume anything about the dress, just go in. And if a client tells you, well, the, the, the dress is white and, and gold, don't think he's, you know, dumb or an idiot, it's just he looks at the problem in a different way. That doesn't mean he's wrong, it doesn't mean he looks at it a, a different way. So it's just different. So Bruce Les, in order to taste my cup of water, you must first empty your cup. So in order to understand what your client is trying to tell you, you must get away from all your previous assumptions, basically. Now listen. So, next one. Recognize the value. So value is a kind of intangible thing, right? So let's try and explain it using a user story. As a Kung Fu master, I want to travel fast to dojo so I can prove I'm the best. So this is a user story Bruce Lee could have written. Um, the first thing you probably think is, well, he's going to need a car. If he's going to travel the entire of China fighting all the dojos, then he's probably need a car. But a car is very complex to make, right? It takes a lot of moving parts and a lot of engineering in order to get it right. And then even when you do get it right, they often break down randomly. So when you approach a problem, or you pro approach a problem space, instead of trying to solve the entire thing in one go, try to think of a way in which you can iteratively add value or solve tiny bits of the problem along the way. So if you do you know, the car thing, where Bruce Lee is unhappy up until he actually gets a car, which you know usually takes a while. You can do it like this. So start with a skateboard, then a step, then a bike, then a motorcycle, with a, then a car. So I have just a vision of Bruce Lee on a skateboard going through the MLI is just hilarious to me. <laughs> so to add value doesn't mean you, uh, to add revenue, right? Value can be in easy to change, refactor, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, uh, value is intangible. But we want to make value, and we want to make it more valuable along the way. So, a lot of the times when I hear people complain about legacy code, for instance, they say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, or this looks ridiculous, or whoever made this, oh, it was me. Um, the reason that you're actually looking at a project is because it was successful to begin with, right? If it wasn't successful, then you wouldn't be hired to solve any issues they have now. So you can have the perfect code, but if it's not successful, then you know, what value is that? So even with ugly legacy code, we can still add value. Or as Andrew Hunt and David Thomas in the Pragmatic uh, Programmer like to say, great software today is often preferable to perfect software tomorrow, right? So try and find value in what you're adding to in the problem space. And in the end, you'll figure out, well, if he's going to go through China, maybe a, a car is not that great of a solution. I should, should have just built an, uh, an airplane. But starting with an airplane, you need a lot of money, 
and a lot of investment, where starting with you know a skateboard is pretty easy, right? And always hindsight is 2020. So, so the key to immortality is first living a life worth remembering. So having value from day one is extremely important for most projects, just to survive, right? So next one. Use the simplest, most direct approach first. So this is about, you know, if you can strike someone, strike him. So, example. Find X, there it is. <laughs> Sometimes the simplest solutions are okay. They're good enough to solve whatever problem you have, right? It doesn't have to be very complicated. It doesn't have to be, you know, abstract, et cetera, et cetera. This is fine. Because sometimes that's all you need. Just to add some, you know, extra functionality, just a simple solution is good enough. So to illustrate this, a little image. So there's three balls here, the top one, middle one, and bottom one. So hands up, who thinks the top one is going to be uh, the first one down? That one? Middle one. Two, three hand ish. Bottom one? Okay. So this is about how our assumptions as software developers are mostly wrong. So the three who had their middle, the middle one, very good work. The rest of you, congratulations, you just created legacy. Second. Okay. Next one. Change is inevitable. Like I said before, with the Chimera and with uh, the project, change is going to happen to your project, unless you don't have a client or unless you're only working on, you know, a hobby project. But even then, change is going to be inevitable in the end. So Bruce Lee said this. Adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. So in this case, don't get too attached to your code, right? There's a famous saying going, all models are wrong, but some are useful. If you had something that solved the problem for earlier, but now because of changing requirements, it doesn't solve it, just change it. Remove whatever you, you know, don't need, keep what is actually working, and add anything that solves the new problem, right? So let's talk about dry for a bit, just because it's a pet peeve of mine. So anyone uh, doesn't know, dry stands for don't repeat yourself. It's very much aligned with a single responsibility principle, but not exactly. So don't repeat yourself tells us, hey, there should be only one place in the code where something is, or manifests, or exists. <laughs> so let's say we're Amazon. We have sales and we have support, right? So sales is interested in a potential customer that wants to buy stuff. Um, what for, what's important for sales is mostly where is this potential customer situated? It has to do with the territory and the, uh, and the taxes he has to pay. Opportunity, so how much can I go down in price while we're still profitable? Pipeline, how many potential customers do we have? I mean, if we have a lot of potential customers, then my margin can go a bit lower because we have volume, et cetera, et cetera. And the product is mostly how much does it cost? What is the, you know, the cost of making it or buying it in? And, and then for what price can I sell it? Whereas the support side of Amazon doesn't talk about potential customers because you already are a customer, right? They're more interested in, hey, um, whatever you bought is broken. So what's the warranty like? What's the firmware? Is it a common problem? Was it a dead on arrival, right? Same product, completely different questions about the thing, right? So if we put them all together, it's going to be a very confusing product and a very confusing customer. So now our salesperson can, you know, uh, refund money from a product that he has bought for a potential customer, you know, that's kind of weird. Or our support can have access to products that haven't actually been sold yet. So it's kind of very weird to have those type of concepts in the same thing, right? So my solution to that would be 
do repeat yourself. So make them two separate things. The thing is, though, you have to do it with intent. That doesn't mean you should just you know, go to your code and then uh, unravel all the different things. It's just that make a conscious decision if you want to repeat yourself, because it's logical uh, to do at that point in time. <laughs> Last one. So experiment. As I said before, it's kind of hard to do things correctly the first time you do it. But what if you try an approach where you try a couple of different things and see which one solves the problems the best? Because if you do it like that, it's very little in, uh, investment in time, but it can have enormous gains. So if you would teach someone Kung Fu, for instance, you don't start them out like this, like with a master sumo wrestler. You start them out like this, where they get some time and space to grow, learn about Kung Fu, or maybe, you know, from there on, grow further. So experimentation is pretty important. And remember, mistakes are always forgivable if one has the courage to admit them. So if you experiment and something doesn't work, just, you know, hone up to it. So, BLDD in a nutshell. Begin at the core, recognize the value, use the simplest, most direct approach first, change is inevitable, and experiment. And for those of you who can't see it, that spells Bruce. So, isn't this just like a new dogma to interchange, you know, all existing dogmas? Not really. I would say BLDD is just a set of mindset or a set of rules you can keep in mind when you're trying your day-to-day -day work. Remember, a goal is not always meant to be reached. It's often served simply as something to aim at. It's not something to become Bruce Lee. It's just a set of principles that might help you and do you know, better at what you do. So, does that mean we should forget about all these design patterns and you know, all the great books of old, the, you know, you know, the canon stuff. Should we just burn them all, all right? Of course not. Obey the principles without being bound by them. Bruce Lee didn't reinvent new Kung Fu. He just took a bunch of stuff that was already widely known, put them together and made its own version of it. That doesn't mean it's different. Well, it is different, but it's not brand new. It's just a different approach to the same problem. So this is what you can do in your day-to-day -day life. Look at a problem, look around you, see what, you know, what options are out there, and don't just take always the, the one you know about, but you know, think outside the box. Are there other solutions that maybe do this better? So how do you start applying this? How do you start doing BLDD? Well, Bruce Lee has this to say. If you want to learn to swim, jump into the water. On dry land, no frame of mind is ever going to help you. Right? So just start. I haven't written a book about it, so there's no other context for you. Just start and see if it helps you. Finally, I would like to end this with this specific quote from Bruce Lee, which I like very much. Don't get set into one form. Adapt it and build your own and let it grow. Be like water, my friends. Be like water. That was my talk. <laughs> <laughs>